Thank you. Uh, during this uh, next session, what I would like to do is address what I would call incidental osseous lesions and really when you need to worry about some of these lesions which are frequently seen on uh, either incidental findings on MR or CT. And specifically at the completion of this session, I'd like you to recognize the common incidental musculoskeletal osseous lesions that may mimic more sinister disease and identify distinguishing features so that you can say this is either something that we don't need to worry about or don't need to follow or something that we do. And the lesions that I've picked are these listed here uh, and I've picked these um, for no other reason other than these are the lesions that I'm most frequently asked by my body colleagues to comment on. And they'll send me a case, uh, unfortunately, often, uh, particularly on MR imaging, without even a single T1 weighted segment uh, with their in and out of phase imaging as their uh, substitute T1 weighted image. And they say, geez, what do you think this is? And I always say to myself, if I only had some diagnostic imaging, it would be fine. But we try to do the best we can. But these are the lesions that I'm most frequently asked about. And so I put them together uh, today to look at in greater detail. And let's begin with one of the most common lesions that we see of the anostosis or bone island. As we know, it's a very common lesion. It is not addressed by the World Health Organization because it's really not a tumor. It's considered a hamartoma in the sense that it's normal bone that occurs in an abnormal location, in this case within the medullary canal. It's certainly frequent in the pelvis, the ribs, and femurs, and we see it as an incidental finding on imaging, not infrequently at all. It's reported in about 1 to 4 percent of radiographs. That classic number of 1 percent comes from an old study uh, in the 60s where they looked at 5,000 consecutive radiographs and came up with 42 bone islands. I think with CT we see it so much more commonly than that. But that's a number that's in the literature. And in one study where they looked at spine, they saw it in 4%. And when they correlated that actually with specimen radiographs, they found 14%. Really just underscores the fact that they're more common on uh, more detailed imaging than on radiographic evaluation. They tend to be round to oval. And the classic radiographic finding is this brush or spiculated <laughs> margin. Due to the fact that the, the lesion itself sort of blends imperceptibly with the surrounding uh, cancellous bone. Typically, bone scan is normal, and because it is cortical bone, it has to image like cortical bone no matter what the imaging modality is. And it's important to remember, although we like to think of these as static lesions, their size may change over time. Because this is normal cortical bone, it's composed, composed of compact lamellar bone with an inversion system, and it blends imperceptibly with the surrounding trabecular or spongy bone. This is the classic margin of a bone island. Dense cortical bone blending imperceptibly with the surrounding trabecular bone, and we see that morphology radiographically and on CT and MR. And this music is coming from this machine that I somehow managed to <laughs> stimulate. Uh, hmm. Okay. Since I have no idea what to do, my computer skills are somewhat limited. Uh, oh my God! What is this? Oh my God! Something is happening. Uh -huh. Do you know something? Yeah. This is cool. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I do apologize for that serenade. Okay. So here the classic radiograph and radiograph and corresponding macroscopic section of a classic bone island. 
and again where you can see that beautiful example of a spiculated margin. And we can see that very nicely here, a patient with a bone island of the rib. Notice, if you will, on the specimen radiograph that they're often oval. They can be round to oval, and you can see that spiculated margin, although sometimes you really do have to look for it to see it well. We can see it as an incidental finding very nicely on CT and radiographs, and again, this patient being followed up for a fracture of the scaphoid. But you can see that nice bone island in the capitate, and again, you can see that spiculated margin, and that allows you to make that diagnosis with confidence. More recently, uh, there was an article uh, that really looked at the CT attenuation of untreated osteoblastic metastases and the CT of bone uh, islands. And, uh, and there really is a dramatic difference between those. And actually, we've used this uh, even in a short time since this came out uh, in, in print form uh, last year, a number of times for those people that came in with isolated, very large bone islands where there was a concern or a history of prostate metastases that they hadn't been treated for. Uh, uh, and um, it really has been a very useful thing based on CT attenuation, a very useful uh, uh, diagnostic consideration. We can see them in the spine. I hear a patient and the imaging features are just as you would expect. No signal, imaging identical to cortical bone, and again, with that spiculated margin. And if we do it, and this is a noisy T2, but it makes the point that there's no abnormal signal surrounding it, and we'll talk about why that becomes so, so important in a moment. Often, when they're in the spine, they tend to be peripherally located as this, but that shouldn't dissuade you. This is a typical bone island, this back, this, uh, despite the fact that it's somewhat irregularly <coughs> shaped. And again, you can see that speculated margin. This is a patient who had a history of previous prostate disease uh, that was recently diagnosed, had this lesion uh, that was in his ileum that was biopsied and confirmed as a giant bone island. We use that term giant for more than two centimeters in diameter uh, or in largest dimension here. It's seven year follow up. You can see that it's increased somewhat in size. And again, these can change, although they do change slowly over time. And they can even get smaller in here, a patient being followed. I have no pathology on this, but certainly a decrease in size over an interval of four years for this presumed bone island. As I said, they can become quite large, as in this case. When they get large, they can sometimes have a little bit of abnormal signal in the event that the cortical bone may have some areas. Remember, this is intramembranous bone formation as these form, and so sometimes the ossification could be somewhat slightly irregular, but typically similar to cortical bone, and because they are so much more bone present at them, they often will show increased tracer accumulation and can show a hot spot on scintigraphy. And a large lesion, but this pathologically proven. And if you look at that, particularly on the axial imaging, that beautiful spiculated margin, highly characteristic in this case of a pathologically proven bone island of the distal femur. Now, some mimics, sure, we can see a lesion like this. Those of you who do a lot of MR can see that little susceptibility artifact, and CT beautifully shows this pneumatocyst mimicking, mimicking an uh, a bone island on MR, and we've certainly had patients referred for metastatic disease with a history of prostate cancer for pneumatocysts in the past. Here we looked at non-ossifying fibromas before, but a nice example of a ossifying non-ossifying fibroma, so I usually use the term healing non-ossifying fibroma or sclerosing fibrosanthoma, but a nice example, and this was a patient who came and had this lesion and was sent for further evaluation where none is uh, required. Notice, if you will, a little expansile remodeling of the cortex, very typical of that disease process, and again, a slightly heterogeneous. This is a beautiful example of how these non-ossifying fibromas or fibroxanthomas heal, and they tend to sclerose from the diaphyseal side. And when I see something like this, that's really highly characteristic. And you can see they follow this patient. Why so frequently? I don't know. But a beautiful example of how this sclerosis from the diaphyseal side progresses. Uh, and 
for some reason they stopped after almost three years. It would have been nice to get it to be completely ossified, but, but this is how they did stop. But a nice example of that sclerosing lesion, again, not to be confused with a bone island. The thing that we worry about is this type of a lesion. This is a patient with a documented metastasis that was initially called a bone island. And how do you distinguish these small osseous lesions from bone islands from, from uh, evil things? And here's a typical case. This was a patient just diagnosed with prostate cancer, had this CT, and this lesion was called a bone island. He had an MR of his prostate, and this was obtained during that exam. And I would argue, retrospectively at least, if somebody asked me if this was a bone island, I would say on T2-weighted images, it does not image identical to that of cortical bone. They did contrast enhancement, and if you'll notice, this was again taken from evaluation from his prostate exam, you can see a halo of enhancement surrounding the lesion. Classically, there should be no enhancement surrounding, and this has been described as the halo sign. Certainly, this was not picked up. He came back in four months later during follow-up, and you can see the bone island has certainly grown dramatically during that time. And of course, this was a sclerotic metastasis. And at that time, he had not only that lesion, but a new <coughs> lesion in his proximal femur. And again, his previous bone scan four months earlier had been normal. And follow-up um, MR imaging now done with musculoskeletal protocol really beautifully shows the lesion and shows that halo sign to better advantage, a very nice way. It's not always positive. The sensitivity is supposed to be close to 100% so specificity about, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, sensitivity about uh, 75% and the specificity about 100% for metastasis. I'm not sure it's quite that accurate. We've had a couple of false positives, but yet it is a very, very good test for distinguishing bone islands from, from uh, osseous metastases, and particularly in patients on their initial presentation for metastatic prostate disease, really. And this is the initial reference article by Mark Schweitzer back from 93, a very good example of that sign. When do I worry about bone islands? Again, I worry when they grow rapidly, when they're hot, again, particularly when they're small and hot, when they don't follow the cortical imaging no matter what modality it is on and when I see a positive halo sign on any modality. So, bone island, usually small, round to ovoid with spiculated margins, no signal on MR imaging, image similar to that of cortex, and bone scan negative, although very large lesions can be positive again, and that has to be interpreted in the context of the size of the lesion. Now, I briefly talked about cartilage lesions before. Now, enchondromas are very common. Chaffee postulated that they really represent embryonic rests of cartilage from the physeal plate that are displaced into the metaphysis. And he did this in the early 1950s. And so he envisioned this lesion as a, a dysplastic focus of cartilage that was separated into the metaphysis, and sometimes this became quite lobulated and separated by little areas of normal marrow fat. And that really was a very good description. Typically, we know that they occur in both men and women, boys and girls. The peak incidences in the third decade of life when they present, very common in the hands. Maybe an incidental finding on, certainly when I was in the Army, we would see these very frequently in, in the troops following some physical activity or an altercation where they'd come in with a pathologic fracture. And it's been now recently identified as an incidental finding in about 3% of MR imaging of the knee and about 2% in the shoulder. And if we think about the histology, that these are hyaline cartilage lesions that can have some myxoid change within them and variable amounts of amorphous calcification and enchondral ossification, and they're separated by little islands of fat, it's a very easy diagnosis to make. Here a typical enchondroma, again, well delineated from the surrounding bone that it is within, and we can see the areas of enchondral ossification giving those arcs and rings of mineralization, as well as some flocules and stipules of calcification within the cartilaginous lesion. So an easy matrix to recognize and an easy pattern of growth to identify. Typically, they have a lytic lesion with variable matrix and margin, usually central in the metaphysis. And of course, in the small bones, can cause some expansile remodeling.
Now, this is a patient who had a radiograph that was considered as normal and had this incidental finding within it. And retrospectively, I think you can see some subtle matrix within it. And of course, the MR very nicely shows the hyaline cartilage within it and the areas of decreased signal secondary to the mineralized matrix within the lesion. We can very nicely see on axial imaging the lesion, and if you look at it, you'll notice that there are areas of fat that extend between the lobules of cartilage. Again, this tends to grow very characteristically in that lobular configuration, and I find that one of the most useful signs that you'll see. Remember, if you think about it, how cartilage grows and how metastases or other evil things grow. When things are evil, they tend to grow centripetally, pushing the marrow away. Cartilage lesions are one of the very few lesions that you'll actually see internal fat between the lobules of the cartilage. And that's a very helpful sign in making this diagnosis. Now we looked at a case of lymphoma that had some fat within it, but the pattern of that fat is very, very different than we see that in an enchondroma and a very characteristic appearance. And when contrast is given, we very nicely see that septal and peripheral pattern of enhancement is demonstrated here, an easy diagnosis to make. And when you think about the hyaline cartilage, look how it grows in lobules in a normal enchondroma, again, with those fat areas of marrow between the lobules, a very simple diagnosis when you look at the fine points of it. So when we look at this lesion, we can see the fat within the interstices of the lesion. We can see the beautiful high signal intensity of the fat on T1, the high signal intensity of the lesion, the hyaline cartilage on T2, with that lobular pattern of growth, what else could this be? This a nice incidental enchondroma. And notice the physis in the metaphysis of classic location, particularly for these small incidental lesions. And again, another enchondroma. Notice the fat going within it, the lobulated pattern of growth, the high signal intensity intermediate on T1 on your left with these areas of decreased corresponding decreased signal representing the mineralized matrix within it. When do I worry? I worry when they have marked radionuclide uptake greater than that of the iliac crest. I worry when there's deep endosteal scalloping or extensive endosteal scalloping more than two-thirds of the thickness of the cortex more than two-thirds the length of the lesion. I worry when I see a change from old films, and I worry when there's an epiphyseal location. That is not that you can't have benign enchondromas of the epiphysis, and we see it very frequently, but in one study where they looked at epiphyseal cartilage lesions of those 17 that they had, 15 were malignant. So when I have one that goes in the epiphysis or is solely in the epiphysis, I just say, I don't see any evidence of an aggressive biological behavior, assuming if I don't, but I say because of its location, we need to follow this up. And so that's why I worry. And so here, cartilage lesion, we'd all make the diagnosis based on the pattern of matrix mineralization. And it goes to the cortex, but it certainly doesn't scallop it. Patient had no symptoms. And the way I read this out is I say, yada, 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 looks like cartilage but I don't see any evidence of an aggressive biological behavior. And where I practice, everybody gets at least one follow-up. And I have one beautiful case of a cartilage lesion with almost 60 years of follow-up. Gentleman came in, at the time that he came in, he had a de-differentiated chondrosarcoma. And about 10 years before that, you could start to see some changes within it. But he had uh, a film when he joined the Navy about 50 years prior to that. And it was probably the same for about 50 years before it started to de-differentiate, initially becoming a low-grade chondrosarcoma and then a high-grade sarcoma. And when he presented, he was well in his uh, late 80s. Uh, but, but you can't follow them forever. But we usually get one follow-up to make sure that they're stable. And then we just caution the patient and tell them if they get symptoms, they need to come back and have it re-evaluated. Here, a patient who had this picked up at a DEXA study as an area of increased opacity on DEXA, and we'd look at that. You can see the change in the matrix mineralization. Of course, we had no old films, but it certainly looked like it was focally different. We can see the focal thick or the focal area of uh, endosteal scalloping, and this was a low-grade chondrosarcoma uh, nicely picked up on a DEXA study. And you can see some periosteal thickening associated with it as well.
just a low-grade chondrosarcoma arising in a previous enchondroma. So enchondroma is certainly common. 2 to 3 percent on incidental findings on MR, very characteristic imaging, and chondrosarcoma will usually show aggressive features. Now I'll mention subchondral cystic lesions just very briefly because there's actually some very nice new literature about this. We sometimes call them interosseous ganglia, although there is no such thing really histologically. It is not a distinct lesion. It's separate from a subchondral degenerative cyst, and I really think that term grew because we had patients that had these lesions that were too young to have degenerative changes. So we didn't want to call it degenerative arthritis in someone that's in their 20s, so they called it an intraosseous ganglion, although histologically that is not a distinct diagnosis. Sometimes called synovial cyst, subchondral bone cyst, or subarticular pseudocyst. Certainly it's not a cyst, and I think the more current terminology is now subchondral degenerative cyst-like lesion. And again, it's not a cyst, it's not necessarily fluid filled, and more, more often has this mixoid snot-like material within it, and they're not epithelial lined. Uh, so really, cyst is probably not an appropriate name. And they're common, usually small, variably cystic, again, often mucoid filled rather than that, and they tend to occur in older patients, usually on those large joints associated with degenerative disease. There's always been this question of whether it was due to intrusion from fluid from the joint into the subchondral lesion or whether it was secondary to changes within the cartilage. And I think the evidence today suggests that it's due to focal injury to the joint with focal fibrous proliferation and secondary cystic change. And I think there's good literature to show that now. So this contusion theory is really likely the cause of these lesions. And in support of this comes an article very recently in radiology in 2010 where they looked at patients that had these edema-like changes below the cartilage and they followed them longitudinally over years and they found that these cyst-like areas form in those areas of edema-like change. Now we know that what we call edema, certainly in osteoarthritic patients, is not edema. We use that term because it has a fluid-like signal intensity, but in fact, it's really marrow necrosis, necrotic or remodeled trabeculae, marrow fibrosis, hemorrhage, and although edema is present, it is really not a major constituent of that abnormal, quote, edema-like signal. So I won't let the fellows use that term marrow edema. I, that's a no-no. Uh, that's like coming late to work. It just shouldn't happen. And so that's it. We call it edema-like. It's a small point, but it makes them think when to use the term edema and when to really understand the pathophysiology. And in this case, really, it's not edema. It's edema-like. And it's those areas where these cystic areas form, these subchondral cysts. And they may form individually, but they can coalesce into very larger lesions. And that's the pathophysiology of how these form. And when they form secondary to injury in younger people, they were given that term of an intraosseous ganglion. So the subchondral cyst-like lesions, often associated with degenerative disease, as we talked about, I think when they get older, they often communicate with the articular surface as they've been there for longer, and that articular surface becomes more traumatized, and typically small rounded lucencies, again, with sclerotic margins. And MR really reflects this pathophysiology well. Here, a typical patient with this cyst-like lesion below the tibial plateau. And here we have a typical tibial plateau. You can see the cartilage overlying it. You can see this area now in which the normal fatty marrow has been replaced by this fibrovascular tissue. And if we look at a small portion of it and look at it at higher power, we can actually see these multiple cyst-like areas forming within this fibrovascular tissue that has secondarily changed within the normal fatty marrow. This becomes mucoid filled. This mucoid material can coalesce and eventually liquefy and form these subchondral degenerative cyst-like lesions that we see. And here a patient with advanced degenerative disease of the hip, and when we take these out, they're not fluid-filled. They're often this gunk-filled mucoid material as shown on this uh, specimen uh, photograph.
Okay, and here another patient with advanced degenerative disease. This cyst-like lesion within the femoral head clearly had a more cyst-like character to it, and this was in fact fluid-filled surgery. So this can actually liquefy, but again, that's a time-dependent change. Often the radiographic findings can be subtle, and we'll often see this fluid-like signal, which may be myxoid material with that thin sclerotic margin and some of that edema-like chain surrounding it. Very typical of these subchondral cyst-like lesions uh, that we see on MR imaging. And certainly they can become very large, and we know that particularly patients with pyrophosphate disease and pyrophosphate arthropathy will often have these very large cyst-like lesions associated with it, as demonstrated here. This case nicely evaluated initially for tumor. We can see the chondrocalcinosis. We can see the enormous cystic area. And this follow-on MR very nicely shows this cyst-like morphology. We can see that cyst-like wall within it and of course some edema-like change in its margin. Again, a subchondral degenerative, in this case cystic lesion, long-standing cystic change. So when do I worry about these? I worry when they're not subchondral, I worry when they don't have an indolent radiographic appearance, and I worry when they're areas of solid enhancement. So subchondral stress, really common, not a true cyst, and typically small with the exception of those associated with pyrophosphate arthropathy. The last lesion I'm going to mention is one that we see quite a bit of, of the intraosseous lipoma. Initially described back in the, the 80s uh, and considered rare, but when we do a lot of MR now, we see them with fair frequency. They're most common in what I would call middle age, the fourth to sixth decade of life. Often described initially again, although I think most today are asymptomatic, but with minor aching pain and up to about 65% in the classic descriptions from the previous literature. Typically in the long and flat bones with most frequently found in the lower extremity, and I think that is really true today as well. They usually appear as geographic lytic lesions with variable but typically sclerotic margin and often sometimes areas of increased opacity within them. Expansile remodeling at about 68% and usually towards the ends, although not invariably, but usually towards the metaphyseal or epiphyseal regions of the bone. They frequently have some dystrophic calcification and can have what we would call involutional change with that calcification and associated cyst formation. Now Milgram in some classic arteries, James Milgram was an orthopedic surgeon, uh, talked about them as being either completely fat-filled, which he called the stage one lesion, a viable lipoma, or they could have some mixed lipomatous areas with partially necrotic fat with calcification or mostly necrotic fat, which could not only have calcification but could have cyst formation and reactive bone. So generally they were either fat or fat with varying amounts of involutional change secondary to fat necrosis, ossification, and cyst formation. And so we tend to call them, rather than use Milgram's initially, uh, initial system, we tend to call them either simple intraosseous lipomas or intraosseous lipomas with involutional change. This was a patient who came in and had this lesion within the proximal femur. You can very nicely see that sclerotic margin and you can see some areas of increased mineralization within it. And if I ask you, does that look like the typical arcs and rings and stipules and flocules, you might say, well, no, not really. It looks more more amorphous, like ossification, which is exactly what it was, this dystrophic ossification occurring within the fat necrosis. Typically, these will show mildly increased tracer accumulation on scintigraphy, and on MR imaging, we will often see a fat-like signal within it, but many times as we get this involutional change, it won't just be pure fat, but it'll be areas of increased signal on fluid-sensitive sequences and decreased signal on T1-weighted image, as we see here with this patho logically proven intraosseous lipoma with involutional change. This was a case we had quite recently. A patient came in, had this lesion. He was in for evaluation of his hip on his way to hip arthroplasty. He'd had this lesion eight years earlier, 
and I think there was a pretty dramatic change. He went ahead and got an MR, which really showed that that was just completely, basically fat-filled. Well, this was a great opportunity. We said, okay, he's going to surgery. Let's see what that is made of histologically, because although the histology of enterosseous lipomas has been well described, the uh, genetics of it has not. And we know now that about 80%, up to 80% of those superficial lipomas have different genetic makeup than the normal fat. And so this was a great opportunity to see if the same is true for intraosseous lipomas. The moral of that story is make sure everybody on the operating team knows what you want to do with the sample because we wound up putting it in formalin and so they couldn't get any genetic material from it, but it was still a gorgeous example of an intraosseous lipoma with pathologic correlation. Here another example, patient on a follow-up study for his myeloma had this lesion on a skeletal survey, nicely showing an intraosseous lipoma with some cortical scalloping. And if I showed you this, I don't think anyone in the audience would have any concern to say this is an intraosseous lipoma with central cyst in the classic location in the calcaneus. But if I showed you this lesion as an unknown, you might have some questions about it. But if you look carefully, you can see that central cyst within another area with a thin area of calcification slash ossification at its periphery. And if we look at the axial imaging, we can see that central cyst within a larger lipomatous area. And so I really don't have proof on this, but it did say stim uh, stable for a number of years during follow-up in what I would call an intraosseous lipoma with involutional change. And I do get a lot of consults with my friends in body imaging for cases like this in the pelvis where we see these lesions you can easily identify the fat within it you can see the ossification and I would call this an intraosseous lipoma with involutional change uh, at the old AFIP they used to consider them as fibroosseous lesions so many times I used to read them out as benign fibroosseous lesions because if you said that in the report nobody ever questions you or calls you about it. If I call it an intraosseous lipoma with involutional changes I still do get I get some calls but but I uh, that's probably more correct for diagnosis. When people ask me when do I ever worry about that I used to say uh, when do I worry well never although there have been a few reported cases of malignant transformation unless I see some aggressive features I really think these require no follow-up. I've had probably uh, a half a dozen of these that I've biopsied over the years uh, for various reasons or I've seen the biopsy results and very frequently there's no pathologic correlation because they just read it out and they get marrow or uh, fat with uh, involutional change in fat necrosis and so you never really get a diagnosis of an intraosseous lipoma but I really feel quite confident that that's what they represent. So almost never is probably more accurate. So intraosseous lipoma certainly not an uncommon incidental finding usually metaphyseal or epiphyseal frequent calcifications and involutional changes with associated fat necrosis and cyst formation and that is pretty much it. So, incidental MSK lesions may simulate more significant disease. However, close attention to the imaging features will usually allow a very accurate diagnosis. Thank you.